we now can kind of lay out a definition, a neurobiological definition of what an emotion is. Because as uh, the lay public, we have a lot of ways of thinking about emotion and feeling. And I just want to uh, lay down what I mean when I say emotion and feeling so that for the rest of the day, we have a common definition to work from. So I'm going to unpack this with you slowly. What is an emotion? So just follow along with me, and I'll, and I'll take each piece apart. From a neurobiological perspective, from an evolutionary perspective, and by evolution, I, I don't mean through time necessarily, I mean uh, cross species, right? The dog versus the children. Emotions are packages of behaviors and cognitive strategies. Okay, let's just stop there. Okay, just stop there. They're packages, okay? You cannot pick and choose the pieces. These things are completely induced as one thing, and they're not just the physiological reaction, they're also the mind state that accompanies that reaction. When you have an emotion about that photograph, or when you're the person in that photograph, you're actually experiencing that physiological change and the accompanying mind change. You know a lot about what those people are thinking about. You can imagine not the specifics of their thoughts, but the kind of thoughts that they're having, just by looking at the external manifestations of their physiology, which is what their emotion is. Okay? So they're packages of behaviors, and we know this also from uh, really tragic cases of, of very peculiar, weird brain damage that can happen. And sometimes in neurobiology, we, we learn a lot from very particular cases that have very specific and very tragic but very weird things. And they can teach us a lot about how the mind is actually grounded in the brain. Um, and there are a couple of cases now accruing in the literature that have, uh, that have been described by Antonio Damasio and uh, now by other people, where uh, where someone came, there's this one guy who came, to, the first one came to the, uh, came to the neurology clinic complaining that um, he was just guffawing with laughter at his mother's funeral. And he, he was absolutely devastated that his mother had died. He loved his mother deeply, but he could not stop laughing, right? Um, and then as he's telling the physicians this, he suddenly just burst into uncontrollable sobbing. And he was saying, I, I don't feel sad right now necessarily, though I'm starting to because I'm crying so hard, but I can't stop crying. I know it's totally inappropriate. There's nothing sad in this situation, but I can't stop, okay? Um, and uh, tragically, this man died just a few days later, and on the autopsy, they found that he had a very specific tiny stroke right in the region of his brainstem, which I'm going to show you later in my data, um, right in the region of his brainstem, which is sort of a convergence crossing point for where the brain and the cerebellum are sending signals down to the body, where it's sending down what turns out to be the package that plays out as an emotional response, okay? When you trigger, it's like a little puppet master pulling the strings in your brainstem. It all funnels down to these fibers densely packed and very, very specifically organized. And when they come down, you pull the string. This one is sadness, okay? And with it comes the whole package. You get the facial expression, the crying, the heart rate deceleration, the, the mood changes, and the cognitive changes. Along with that, you start thinking about other sad things. Or you get fear, you know? With fear, the most, you know, most, one of the earliest described emotions, you get the accelerated heart rate, the shift in blood flow to your limbs so that you can fight or fly or flee or whatever you want to say, um, you get the facial expression and you get the mindset thinking about how can I escape from this situation.